Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, SLT and uh, my excitement around SLT as really first line treatment. I think to me nowadays, we've seen such an incredible proliferation of technology in the glaucoma space that we have a lot of opportunities to address compliance and really be, I think, aggressive with IOP reduction early on. And we'll talk about patient selection and the need and the reason why first line SLT is appropriate. Show of hands, anybody here performing SLT currently? Okay, keep those hands up if you're doing it first line. Okay, yeah, so we're mixed, and I think we're still seeing, still some doctors feel comfortable, some don't, we'll talk about that. For me personally, I think we, we've been, I've been part of a, a revolution, a paradigm shift in glaucoma. I'm old now, I've been around for 18 years after fellowship, and I can tell you there's a new change in paradigm and mindset around glaucoma, this idea of interventional glaucoma. But what does that mean? Well, what interventional glaucoma means to me is the fact that we don't have to always choose anymore between maintaining a high quality of life and controlling IOP at the same time. We're also able to, in other ways, looking at it as addressing compliance at the same time of maintaining high safety. Right? We never had that opportunity in glaucoma before, but now instead of just drops and adding more drops and another third and a fourth line drop, we have a lot of options in our armamentarium. Whether it's SLT and other lasers, we have a lot of MIGs, I'm a big fan of micro or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, and we have a drug delivery in the United States, and I think it's coming out here as well in Europe and other areas of the, of the world. But the idea and the reason why we're seeing such a proliferation of technology is because we understand compliance sucks. It is so hard to keep our patients taking medications and being compliant, being adherent, coming back to follow up, paying money for medications. It's very difficult, whether it's cost, side effects, dosing regimen, patients just forgetting to take medications. And you know, we've seen so many different things. I've seen in my practice, if you ever wanna be bored, just ask your patients to take drops in the office and see what they'll do. It's kinda of scary what patients do to actually get their drops in the eye. Very frightening. But it's, we understand that it's hard for drops to get in the eye. Only about 5% of the drop actually gets into the eye with our individual drop that we put on the eye. And we do know that ocular surface disease is a significant risk factor when you have ocular with dry eye and glaucoma. And why? Well, these drops don't penetrate. They stay on the surface. They have BAK and other chemicals. And the studies have shown the more bottles we add, the more risk we have of developing a concomitant ocular surface disease. Why is that important? Well, if you have dry eye, studies have shown, Boudouin and others have shown us, you have decreased compliance. In fact, 30% reduction of compliance if you have a concomitant ocular surface disease. We also know that BAK can cause significant fibrosis of the conjunctiva, limiting our trabeculectomy success, but also we have seen now it can cause a trabeculitis, inflammation of the TM, even causing us to have loss of collector channel or atrophy of the collector system. And I know a lot of colleagues say, well, Paul, I don't have time to check for dry eye. I'm so busy in my glaucoma practicing 40, 50, 60 patients a day. How do I have the time? Well, you don't have to do much. Ask the patient, does your vision come and go? If the vision comes and goes, that's an unstable tear film. Number two, use something called a ratin filter. Uh, there's a filter you can buy now. We have a slit lamp that has a, an automatic filter on it. But if you use a, Amazon, has these $10 filters called the ratin filter, which allows you to see the tear film so much better for, compared to a cobalt blue light. There's a blue light. And here's the filter. And you see that EBMD, the unhealthy ocular surface. So many of my patients, I kind of let go. When I started looking for it, you'd be amazed of how many patients have concomitant ocular surface. And treating patients, you can see on the left, the tear from breakup time is less. And then you look at how much more improved after taking someone off of just one PGA. This is three months after SLT. So we can really help these patients' quality of vision and quality of life. But why is it so important to manage compliance? Well, we do know from many data sets out there that the more non-compliant you are, the more risk of fluctuating IOP. And if you have fluctuating IOP, what can that lead to? Potential for progression. If you look at the advanced glaucoma interventional study and others, we see the more you fluctuate, the more you have a chance of progression of visual fields. So for me, what has changed, the philosophical change, is now when I think of control glaucoma, it is no longer fields are stable, optic nerve is stable, and my pressures are at target. Yes, that's important, still the mainstay. But now, it's what is my patient's ability to stay on that current drug regimen and stay compliant? If I think they have a poor ability to stay on that regimen, they are not controlled, regardless of how good the pressure is at that visit. So this patient, Pressure may be fine, feels may be good, but if someone looks like that coming into your office, are they really gonna take their medications every day? And there are studies that have shown patients do not take medications if they have concomitant hyperemia or lid issues like MGD. So my challenge to all of us, myself included, are drops really safer? 
This is just PGAs alone, whether it's lash growth, hyperemia, allergic conjunctivitis, fat pad loss, babomian gland dysfunction. These are things that happen over time. And we'll hear from our fine doctor here about dry eye in general and how we have many options to treat our patients. But we have to pay attention to symptoms. Patients coming in all day long telling us, please get me off those drops. Listen to them. If they're saying, I need samples every time, probably cost is an issue. If they say my vision comes and goes, ocular surface is probably an issue. If they say, I cannot remember the color of my top of the bottle, they're probably not compliant with their medications as well. So here comes SLT. And this is why, to me, SLT is a first line for a large number of our patients, makes the most sense. It's the most physiologic way of approaching glaucoma. What is glaucoma? A disease of the trabecular meshwork, right? We do know 50% or 70% of our patients, the primary cause of resistance is at the level of the trabecular meshwork. We also have canal collapse, and we also have distal channels atrophying as well. But if primary is TM, let's address the pathology. Let's not just bypass it using drops to the uvascular pathway. If we can directly affect the TM, what can we do long term to affect the natural outflow? If we earlier address the TM blockage and more flow going into the canal, do we prevent the canal from further collapsing over time? These are things that we have to understand more. But this is what SLT does. Primarily excites the level of the trabecular meshwork, right? It does not destroy like an ALT. It's a larger spot size, about a 400 micron spot size, which covers the trabecular meshwork. And unlike ALT on the left, the right we do not see fibrosis or scarring. So for those of you who do MIGS later on, or we want to repeat SLT, we, are, we can repeat SLT, unlike ALT, because we are not causing significant fibrosis and we do not affect the canal behind it if you're doing a canaloplasty or a stent later on as well. And the mechanism of action, just to remind ourselves, it is causing a release of cytokines, interleukins, macrophages, which really open up the TM selectively in the pigmented trabecular meshwork cells as well. So this is a natural way, my way of telling patients, this is the rejuvenation of the trabecular meshwork of your natural drain. But I think SLT has not only a therapeutic, but a diagnostic impact. And I'll tell you about the diagnostic in a second. But how does it work? What does the data show us? And, and what, are, what are the reasons why doctors are not comfortable performing SLT first line? Is there still a thought there's not enough data out there to actually support primary SLT as, as working and that we have repeatability? I want to share with you a number of data sets that really do show us primary SLT is actually probably a better solution than drops. Now, a lot of you have seen and heard Gus Guzzard's work, wonderful work for the light trial. I won't bore with you too much. But it's a very important study. It basically took a latanoprost first line versus SLT first line. Over three years, looked at efficacy. Both had similar efficacy, but in the SLT group, less patients needed drops to attain target pressure. But when you looked at things like cost, quality of life, and need for incisional surgery, progressing to incisional surgery. Zero patients in the SLT group progressed to incisional surgery versus 11 in the um, in the drop group, less visual field deterioration, less cataract surgery. So despite the same efficacy, we see less progression in SLT group. Why? Because of compliance, right? This, that's not the only study, though. For years, we've had multiple data sets. This is McIlrath showing us SLT versus latanoprost at a year out, showing significant stability, rather, non-inferiority to topical drops. CATS, the drop study, another very good study showing, again, non-inferiority to drops with primary SLT as well. And we do know that it does have long-term benefits. People think, well, doc, I'm not sure if it's going to last long enough. Well, number one, we can repeat it. Number two, if you do it primary early on, when you have a healthier outflow system, healthier canal, healthier distal channels, the chances of it working longer seem theoretically to make sense. And we do see that with data. This is an 18-month follow-up showing us stability. We have Jindra, who showed us, I've got five-year data with primary SLT showing stability over five years. So the more, earlier we adopt it, the better chance we have of preventing further collapse, in my opinion, as well. We also have data sets showing us that, yes, we do see natural nocturnal fluctuations in IOP, but we find here with this that we actually have stability over nighttime compared to topical latanoprost in the gray. And, and looking at adjunctive therapy, SLT can work very well. Even those patients who are on previous medications, we can still see significant three millimeters of mercury or greater reduction of IOP, even as an adjunctive therapy as well. So it can be done primary and after being on a topical drop. 
Recently, a study came out here just now with Gunu Garg and Gus Gazard's work showing us that you can repeat. And repeatability, the second repeated after 18 months, they found the same efficacy as a primary therapy as well. So you can repeat it, and it's okay to tell patients it's okay to repeat. I think I'm fine, that's fine. I'll go fast. This is just a little example and a video of using, this is the uh, Tango Reflex here showing us that nice large spot size. We'll talk about kind of data on power and what's the end point, those little champagne gas bubbles. You do not have to find every single shot a champagne bubble. I titrate it so that way as soon as I see a champagne bubble with one of them, I don't increase it to see every single spot showing a champagne bubble. Once you see the bubble, I don't increase the power as well. But some of the pearls, I start about 0.5 or so, 0.6 millijoules. And I go up and down, depending on the level of pigmentation. The more pigmented the, the uh, TM, the lower the, pr tar the uh, power I use, because pigmented patients absorb the energy better and have a little bit higher risk of developing a pressure spike afterwards as well. And so I kind of vary it depending on pigmentation as well, and I use that titration of the champagne bubbles. Once I see it, then I stop increasing the power, even if I don't see champagne bubbles for every single shot I do. Now, patient selection, for the last few minutes here, I know I'm already at four minutes left, it is a very wide patient selection. It is not just POAG patients. Secondary open angle glaucomas, like pigmentary, pseudoexfoliation, steroid-induced glaucoma, these are very TM-based glaucomas, are very good uh, candidates. Post-LPI, patients have a history of a LPI, now are open, who have still some chronic pressure issues, it can work very well for those patients. Just be careful though, patients who are, uh, who've had inflammatory, uveitic, neovascularization, people who are narrow, if you cannot see the trabecular meshwork, not a good idea to perform SLT. But all those other POEG patients are very good, a uh, good patient population as well. Just for the sake of it, I'm gonna fast forward through some of these, just to get through some of the other slides here. Uh, risks. You can get a pressure spike. Again, the more pigmented you can, and the more higher the pressure is to begin with, the likelihood of a pressure spike is greater. Still very low, but that's why we check the pressure within a half an hour, an hour after the procedure, just to be safe. You can get inflammation afterwards. There's something called a SALT trial that showed us that even if you have inflammation, putting someone on Ketorolac, let's say an NSAID, can actually improve the outcomes compared to not using it. So I use an NSAID for about four to five days after the procedure is done. And they can get some transient irritation, headache, et cetera, some light sensitivity, which is very transient as well. And this is the SALT trial showing us that using an NSAID after the procedure for about five to seven days can, at three months, show slightly better efficacy than not using any NSAID or steroid as well. And the COAST trial is a trial that is being worked on right now. I'm actually starting to be part of that trial as well, which is looking at randomizing patients to lower pressure, lower um, power, and doing it oh, every year regardless. So we're not waiting for the pressure to go up before we drew it, it's like a loading dose and keeping it maintained. And so we'll see what that shows us in the future. But I really wanted to end the last two minutes talking to you about how do we describe it to our patients? Because one of the, I think, negatives or barriers for surgeons is how do I convince a patient to do a laser versus drops, right? Drops seem safer. The way I use the terminology I use and the confidence in which you prescri describe it is so important. Patients can pick up on your comfort and confidence. So I tell patients, Mrs. Smith, I'm gonna use a beam of light that's gonna rejuvenate the natural drain. It's gonna use your natural enzymes to excite your tissues to open up those pores naturally. It, in the US, it's covered by insurance. It just takes a few minutes to do, and you get to go home without any kind of um, um, barriers to uh, post-op recovery as well. So these are the key phrases. Now, if they say, is it a laser? Yes, just like a laser pointer we use for the laser. It doesn't hurt you. It is actually something that just excites the tissue. So these are things that I use. I do think also, it is important to recognize the impact of taking someone off of one drop. We have found in our office that we published and presented at ASCRS a few years ago, by getting rid of one topical glaucoma drop, you can save an average of four minutes of tech time per patient per visit, because you save time on the callbacks, on refills, on confirming is a patient on the right medications. So a significant impact there. Cost savings to the healthcare industry. Looking at the, uh, the light trial, the UK saves a significant amount of money, and previous studies have shown significant savings to the healthcare as well as the patients by getting them off of topical drops as well. So in a nutshell, I think that I'm gonna fast forward through here as well, just because I think we have a lot of time. But I do think first line makes sense. It's physiologic, 
it helps address compliance, prevents surface issues. We still have opportunities to put drops if we need to as well. And in my opinion, it gives us an understanding of where the resistance to outflow is. If it works on the level of a trabecular meshwork and it doesn't work because it works about 80% of the time, that 20% of the time that SLT does not have an efficacy, does that tell you the resistance is in the canal or the distal channels? Does that help you decide what type of MIGs to perform as well? So there is a diagnostic potential in my opinion as well. So a lot of rewards taking control back to us, not worrying is a patient taking medications or not. A huge, huge benefit for us long-term control of glaucoma as well. I think the type of laser we use makes a difference as, as well. And uh, my new regimen here, laser first line, MIG second line, more laser, then I'll do a TRAB, and drops are there as needed as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity as well. Nice presentation, Paul. Is there any question in the audience for Paul? I have was that? Go ahead, please. What about the, the women in pregnancy and you can use eye drops in those cases? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think there's a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty of using any topical medication because of systemic absorption like beta blockers and others. And I think that's a great opportunity as well. Even those, those patients who have unilateral glaucoma where there's you know, maybe war in one eye than the other, you know, putting a drop in one eye can cause hyperemia, cause lash issues as well. So it's a great opportunity for those patients. What is your schema? You make one session of SLT and how long do you wait to, to the results? So the full effect can take sometimes four to six weeks to see the results. So I don't really tell the patients I'm not going to decide if it worked or not for about four to six weeks. I'll see them usually about a couple weeks out. And then if that looks good, see them another month later and then kind of decide. Usually I don't repeat it unless I had some efficacy. If I, did, I do 360 degrees with every session. I don't do 180 in general, but I do 360. If it did not have an effect, I don't do a second one. If it did have an effect but starts to wane, then I will do a second treatment even at three months if I need to. Okay. And also, do you use it in ocular hypertension? Absolutely. 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 I have a long spiel on that, but yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any question for the audience? We have plenty of time. Yes, please. So I do one 360 degree session, and that is my litmus test. If it does work well, and let's say it starts to climb up even at three or four months, six months, I will repeat it. If after one session of 360, it did not do much, I don't repeat it again. That's probably a patient who maybe has resistance beyond the TM. But I'll do a second or third you know, session over time if it did have an effect initially. Paul, many people is afraid because the experience with ALT was it, has, it causes damage in the trabecular meshwork, and some people begin only with 180. Mm -hmm. But I realize that 360 is the, the best option. Are you agree about that? To me, we don't know where the resistance to outflow is. We also don't know where the distribution of the collector channels are. There are many data sets out there that show us that the distribution of the collector channels are not equally distributed. Right. And number two, the canal collapse and the kind of the patency of the canal is also not equal 360. So we can hedge our bets better by using 360 degrees of laser and then deciding if it worked or not. So I'm a big fan of 360 first line as well. Uh, and so to me, the fear of ALT versus SLT, I, rec I do agree, ALT does cause destruction. But SLT does not. I have done a number of canaloplasty procedures after SLT. In fact, what I wanted to get to and I have time was I have a data set out there that we're working on getting published where we had failed SLT, did canaloplasty, then did SLT afterwards and found a significant effect. So to me, I think SLT is a great diagnostic tool to tell us where the resistance to outflow is. You have a question, please? Good question. Absolutely. So I, I, I'll tell you why. So Ken, the question is, if you have a trabeculectomy, is SLT even worthwhile doing? The bigger question, I'll answer that in a second, is do we think we can reestablish outflow of the conventional pathway once we bypassed it with a tube or a trap, right? I thought no initially many years ago. But I have now not only done SLT, but even stenting. We've done we have something called the infinite trial with glaucose showing us that those three stents have significant efficacy. And SLT can benefit now. You may have a little bit less efficacy in some patients, no doubt. But the safety being so high, it's still worth it to maybe get them off of one drop. It won't get you down to target pressure of 10, but it can get you some reduction as well. So it's worth a try, even after MIGS. Let's say you do your eye stent, or you do your canal dilation, your goniotomy, and you still have some area of, of TM left over, but the pressures are not where you want it to be, and the patient's not happy going on drops. 
a great opportunity to say, let's try SLT to augment what I did with my MIGS procedure. Okay, there is no question. No more, one question? Yeah. The last one, yes. One more question, sorry. From a corneal perspective, uh, what do you see the role of uh, uh, SLT in patients who've had corneal grafts? and the pressure problems that you can get from that. Is it effective in those situations or? Sure. So the SLT and post, you know, DSAC, DMAC, even, even PKs. Um, yes, it can be if, the, if you have the anatomy still good. Sometimes after a lot of these surgeries, the, the anatomy is not quite as good to, to see. But if you have a good TM that you can see, I think it's a great opportunity to get them off of any topical medication if you can as well. So depending on the anatomy, it's worth a try. Absolutely. OK. It's OK. Let's One more time. <laughs> So when do you stop the medication post-operatively? Uh, great question. It depends on how advanced the glaucoma is. If I have a, a very mild to moderate patient where I'm, let's say, on a PGA, and that's it, let's say, that's it, monotherapy, I will stop it right away and just see how the pressure does. If they're on multiple medications, let's say a PGA and let's say com combination medications, I'll stop the PGA, keep my aqueous suppressants for, for, that, for now, and then at a month, see how they're doing, then take them off others if possible. If they're more advanced, I will keep them on everything until I can confirm that they're doing well, then take one at a time away. So depending on how severe and the number of medications is how I dictate how often or how much to take okay. away. Last conclusion. I have a question for the audience. <clears throat> Why you don't use SLT as primary treatment. <laughs> if I offer you, as a patient, that you will have drops every day, two or three times a day, during a long time, and in the other hand, I have a procedure, one time, five or six minutes, mm -hmm. and then, I don't know why, if someone asks me, what do you want, I realize when I have conjunctivitis or everything, I don't, my compliance is Terrible, and I, I believe everyone in this auditorium should be the same idea. Why we don't change our mind? Last question to you, <laughs> and thank you so much, Paul, for this brilliant <laughs> presentation.